All right. All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, have another good talk tonight um, set up for us. And uh, I'm really excited about this one. Uh, my name is Joshua and I work here at the Wenatchee River Institute. I'm the community programs educator and I help set up these programs. Uh, we have lots of different community programs that we put on um, beyond just these Red Barn events. Um, we have workshops, um, we have different classes. And so we, we try to have as much as we can for everyone to be involved in and connecting. Um, for everyone who's not familiar with the Wenatchee River Institute, we're an outdoor education uh, environmental center. And right now we're in the Red Barn, which is right now a speaking space, but it's uh, earlier today, it was a classroom that we had fifth and sixth graders in here. They were in here and outside doing some snow science, digging snow pits and uh, learning about that. Um, so we have both the community programs and the youth program side of, of what we like to do here. Um, and part of our, uh, our mission, or our mission is to connect people, community, and the natural world. Um, Sorry, I'm going, that's the right way. Um, we also, before all of our programs, we do a, a land acknowledgement um, to make sure that we're giving um, the right credit to those that, that came here before us. So I'm gonna read that now. This land acknowledgement was created alongside the Shimpasquatshu people. We are spreading the message they wish to spread to the public. The land Wenatchee River Institute sits on is the ancestral homelands of the Shimpansquatsu, Pascuotza, or Wenatchee people. Shimpansquatsu, meaning people in between, had villages positioned along the Wenatchee River and surrounding areas. Their ancestral homeland extends from the Cascade Ridge throughout what is now known as the Wenatchee and Okanagan Valleys. The culture and economy of the Shimpansquatsu people centers on taking care of the land. They fish, hunt, gather roots and berries, basket-making materials, and medicines. The Shimpansquatshu are, are named within the Yakima Treaty of 1855. Language to establish the Wenatchee Reservation was never followed through, even with the needed surveying completed. Many Shimpansquatshu now live on the Colville Reservation, 150 miles northeast of Leavenworth. They were forced off their land here, and the U.S. government moved them to this reservation. The Shimpansquatshu people are still alive today. They continue to practice their culture, harvest their traditional foods and medicines, and hold their ceremonies passed down from their ancestors. Most people won't see or notice them, but they continue to be on the land they're connected to. Their traditional language is in Hamchin, an interior Salish dialect. And we'd like to welcome you all by saying hello in their language, Tilhusht. Tilhusht. We offer this land acknowledgement as the first step to amplifying indigenous voices and recognizing the harm done to them as a people. We stand as an ally to recognize their connection to the land and their rights to practice their culture on these sacred lands. We encourage all to learn about the indigenous peoples of the place you now call home. The Wenatchee River Institute is committed to sharing this land acknowledgement and following up with other actions to educate and be respectful. I'd also like to thank our sponsors for supporting the Red Barn events. Um, without them, we wouldn't be able to be able to do these. So um, our sponsors are Gustav's Grill and Beer Garden, Ludwig's German Restaurant, Obertal Inn, Posey Handpicked Goods, South Restaurants, Hotel Pinson Anna, Munchen House, Sleeping Lady Mountain Resort, North Central Washington Audubon Society, Icicle Brewing Company, The Cove Resort at Fish Lake, Colchuck Consignment, Riverfront Rock Gym, Mountain Home Lodge, and Mitchell Reed and Schmitten Insurance. And now to get to our speaker, um, I'm gonna first introduce Joan, who is with the Native Plant Society. Right about there. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening. Um, I'm Joan Frazee, and I'm the chair of the Wenatchee Valley chapter of the Washington Native Plant Society. And we are a statewide organization. Um, 
most of you actually look like you're already members of the Native Plant Society. So I'm not going to do the big commercial break that I was planning on doing. However, I will just flash the brochure for a minute and make sure that if there is anyone here that isn't a member, be sure to pick up a membership brochure on the way out and uh, become a member and join us in supporting being a voice for Native plants in the state of Washington, and especially right here in the Wenatchee Valley. So I'm very excited tonight to have um, this program on monarch butterflies. Um, and uh, I just want to tell you one other big piece of chapter news, which hopefully most of you already know about, and that is we're having our annual social for the first time since February of 2020. We're actually going to gather together at a venue in Wenatchee called Epoch, and um, it's right on Wenatchee Avenue. And um, it's going to be a really fun evening. Um, it's a no-host food bar situation, so you can come on in and order food and a drink and uh, socialize with your fellow native plant people. And there will be a silent auction, which is our, our only fundraiser really of the whole year. And there's gonna be a lot of really cool stuff in the auction from field trips to baked goods to books. We've got a lot of books. Um, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff. So anyway, it's at six o'clock in the evening on March 1st and I hope to uh, see all of you there. And so without further ado, I will turn the, but one moment of thanks to Wenatchee River Institute. Sorry, I don't, I, I didn't organize my speech tonight. So I have to just say one more thing. So cool that Wenatchee River Institute partners with us to bring these events to us because uh, they provide the technology that allows us to have these hybrid programs. So we have a, an audience out there in Zoom land, which is very cool. Without them, we probably wouldn't be able to do hybrid programs. So thank you so much. Okay, I'm done nattering, and now I'll turn it over to the main introduction for tonight, Connie Mamel, our program chair. Yes, so I'm Connie Mamel, program chair and also the treasurer of, uh, of our chapter of the Native Plant Society. And I'm really happy to introduce tonight um, Dr. David James. Um, he's the Associate Professor of Entomology at Washington State University in Prosser. And, uh, and David became a lepidopterist at the age of eight when he started rearing caterpillars in his English bedroom. And uh, years later, of course, he received a science degree in the UK, um, followed by a PhD on monarch winter biology in Sydney, Australia. He has spent a lifetime in applied entomological research, uh, biological control and chemical ecology and pest management, always punctuated by studies on butterflies. And in 2011, he co-authored this book, The Life History of Cascadia Butterflies. This is an amazing book. Um, BBC producer David Attenborough declared that this book was magisterial, and uh, and I would agree with that. This is the only copy that's here. He didn't bring any copies, but take a look. It has all the stages of the insects, from eggs to larvae to all the all the instars of the larvae. Take a look. It's amazing. You won't find another one like it. But since 1999, Dr. James has researched the breeding ecology and migration of monarchs in the Western United States. And that's what he's going to tell us about tonight. Thank you so much for being here, David. Thank you very much for that introduction. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, <clears throat> this talk is... Um, there's a lot of slides here, there's a lot of information too, um, and I don't know how much you know about monarchs. Most people know something about monarchs, so um, I guess stop me if, if you want to ask a question. But So I'm going to, uh, my original title was migration, migration, talking about some of the migration work we've done. I'll talk about that to begin with, uh, but very briefly really, because I want to focus on a lot of the problems that we're having with monarchs today. Um, You've probably heard about the de decline in population and um, horror stories, um, but I want to focus on the bright side, the good side, um, because there is optimism and, uh, and good scientific reason for optimism as well. But anyway, the migration, I've been working on monarch migration in the Pacific Northwest for a decade now. Um, but, but it's unlike the eastern US where there's been a migration program for, for many decades, it's harder to do here because there's so few monarchs in the first place and there's so few people relative to you know, more densely populated areas of the east. Um, so 
you, it's impossible to tag enough monarchs, even when they were more common, um, you know, a couple of decades ago, it would be impossible to tag enough to get data that would, you know, allow us to understand what they were doing. You need to tag about 200 butterflies before you can get one long distance return. So, you know, you might be lucky and, and tag 200 butterflies in the season, um, but that wouldn't help much. So how to tag a lot more monarchs was the problem I had um, more than a decade ago now. Um, and I thought, well, mass rearing is the way to go. And, um, and using you know females from here um that would be a good way to do it but as you heard i'm i'm an economic entomologist not really paid to mass rear monarchs in my lab so it, that really wasn't an option at the time and then i had a phone call from walla walla penitentiary or washington state penitentiary but walla walla who wanted to they wanted to, um, in their mental health program to occupy prisoners with something that would bring them the outdoors without letting them go in the outdoors. Um, and so I immediately thought of this little problem of mass rearing monarchs that maybe I thought they could do. Anyway, long story short, that's what they did. And they loved the program. That, that, that guy there is actually a real prisoner, by the way. So he's not just, looks like he's a model posing, but he's actually a, a prisoner in the prison um, that I when I took the picture. So we had incarcerated citizen science um, ran from, 2012 to 2019, um, and it was extremely successful. Their devotion to caterpillar rearing was incredible. So we had a high survival rate. I mean, they put their all into it. They, you know, the reason for mental health thing was just to occupy them with something. Um, boredom is the biggest problem in in the penitentiary. And these were long-term prisoners too. They, these were not, um, you know, prisoners that were going to be released next year. So. Anyway, they did a great job, and um, and they were the the basis of the migration program. But they were soon joined by citizen scientists um, in Washington, Oregon, in particular, um, Idaho, BC, uh, even Montana had a couple of people. Um, so it really expanded um, over the, the over the first few years. Um, uh, I did, created a Facebook page, it still exists, Monarch Butterflies Pacific Northwest, we talk about other things as well, but but anyway, the, so the results of the, all this um, research was that we tagged 20, nearly 28,000 butterflies um, during that period of time, and they were all reared, uh, we, we did tag some wild ones too, and that data I mentioned later on in the in the talk, um, but much fewer, a little more than a thousand. So we had to rear them to get the numbers. So from that, we had 182 long distance recoveries, uh, which is a good sample for developing ideas about where the butterflies go. Um, in Washington, we reared and tagged 15,000 plus, and recovery rate was actually less um, than in the East, 0.3%. Um, um, and there's a reason for that, um, I'll mention in a minute. Um, Idaho was was even less, um, and we we tagged less there. And we're still, I'm still working on this, and, and we're focusing on Idaho to get them to rear a lot more. Uh, maybe get a prison program going there, um, because there's still questions about where Idaho monarchs go. Um, Oregon, um, we have a huge contingent of citizen scientists there. Um, and we had a recovery rate of 1%, which you'd expect because it's closer to California. So there's um, a sample, sample of the, the routes, or not the routes that they took, the, the you know, release point and the recovery point of individual butterflies. So you can see most of um, Washington butterflies, this is just a sample, um, went to California. So you know, before this work, we assumed they did, but there was no data to actually prove it. So now we have data, and there's two papers published on this. Um, and most of the butterflies we found were in the overwintering colonies. Um, so they they migrated all the way down to the coastal overwintering colonies um, where they overwinter. Um, but there was there was a few, and there's just one on this slide, but we had more than one that took the opposite direction. They 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 headed southeast, um, and the, we thought at the beginning it was just the odd, an odd reason. But it, it's consistent enough to, for me to realize that there is a component of our population that does actually fly in that direction. They don't go to California. So the assumption is that they're heading south 
through Utah. We've had a couple found in Utah. Um, well, that one is Brigham City, just in Utah. Um, um, so we, we, we think they're heading south uh, through Arizona and possibly into Mexico. We haven't had any recoveries to prove that yet. And, and so the further east you go, uh, like into Idaho, um, the more this is apparent And this, this slide shows here, um, we've had far fewer recoveries, as I say. So in this inset here, you can see one was recovered in Walla Walla, and we did get one in California. So at least some do make the trip to California, but it seems from the other lines um, we've got, which don't go very far, but they are heading south, um, not south um, west, as you expect, if they're going to California. So I'm convinced that there's a, quite a large component, and most of the recovery rate there is very low. Uh, this past year, we released, I can't remember now, maybe two or 3,000, not a single recovery. So they disappear off the planet. But what they're doing, I think, is going, you know, along the the interior there where there's even fewer people and, and not being found. And, and if they get to Mexico, they're in amongst the millions that are there. And, and it'd be you know a real long shot to actually get a recovery from Mexico, given there's not going to be many that make it. Um, so that's why we need to step up the tagging in Idaho. And I've actually got a number of people quite invested in this now. So that should go forward in the future. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to dwell on this too much because there's a lot of other stuff I want to talk about. Um, but if you're interested, there's a couple of papers, and I'm going to mention scientific papers all the way through. And if, if anyone's interested in them, I can send you PDFs um, of them. Um, so these, are, these lines are from butterflies tagged in Oregon. So all the Oregon butterflies go to California, as you would expect, even as far south as... Um, doesn't show on there, but uh, down to almost uh, LA. Um, so, so yeah. So that's that's all I'm going to talk about with migration. Uh, we know a lot more now than we did before. Our butterflies mostly go to California, but there's still some evidence that that some actually might make the trip to um, Arizona uh, to Mexico, and that makes sense because we know for sure that Arizona monarchs either go to California for overwintering or go to Arizona, and it's like 50, sorry, Mexico, it's like 50-50. Um, and so if they can, then presumably, you know, the further north you go, it could still, the same thing could happen, where the further inland you are, the more likely they are to head um, to Mexico. But anyway, the state of the monarch now, it, it's a celebration time because the numbers have been um, pretty big for the last two years. Um, they've risen from the dead, if you like, um, from 2020, COVID year, bad times. Um, monarchs had a bad time too. Uh, the, the total population of the overwintering population that year was less than 2,000. You know, and back in the um, 1990s, uh, it was more than a million, more than two million, uh, maybe up to four million. So that is a huge decline. Um, to less than 2,000. And at that time, many people were writing the butterfly off. This is when the stories of extinction um, came about and, uh, and people were really concerned about the future of the species. Um, but, you know, the resurgence wasn't a surprise to me um, because I had already learned from my previous experience that the monarch is extremely adaptable and resilient. And, uh, and I actually... I actually put my words into, into print um, at that time. This was published in March 2021, which is when everyone was talking about spiraling into oblivion. Uh, and I was talking about adapting to a change in the environment because I could see there was a reason for the crash at that time, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so this paper I wrote, and I can send you a PDF of it if you want, um, was the Pollyanna view. I actually got accused by some respected monarch and uh, monarch specialists of being too Pollyannish in my view. I had to look that up because I'm not very well versed in literature. Um, I didn't know what that meant, but so I was a bit disturbed to find out what it meant. But anyway, I, I was optimistic and it was because I had deja vu. What was happening I had seen before. Um, this is a picture taken of me during my university, uh, when I did my PhD on the monarch back in, I'm not going to tell you, when a long time ago, in the 80s, uh, well, it's up there, 1978. Um, 
when monarch populations in Australia, in the Sydney area, um, or New South Wales um, had the same decline, 90% decline. And it was associated with a, a new strategy of winter breeding. And this is what has, what has happened in California too. Um, and there's my PhD and, uh, and a summary paper that was published on my first, well, after my, I attended the conference, uh, Monarch Conference, my first trip to the US back in 84, I think it was, 86, um, where all this this work I did on my PhD was summarized in a paper there. So it's all there in the literature. And it slightly disturbs me that a lot of current monarch entomologists have totally ignored all this that has gone before, um, you know, in prehistoric times, admittedly, but it's still, you know, it's it tells the story of what is going on. So how did we get here um, with the you know, in what has happened in the West uh, with the major decline that I mentioned from, you know, the 1980s, 90s, when estimates, um, you know, and they're not very good estimates compared to what we have now. Um, but, you know, th that what we had was probably more than uh, half a million every year for 12 out of 17 years, and, and maybe up to 4.5 million. Um, and then from 97 onwards, um, we had a new way of assessing populations by the Thanksgiving count. So this was a much better way of, you know, an actual count. Um, and then the population crashed about that time, 97, as you can see. I'll switch over to, to, to the graph you may have seen if you looked at monarch stuff online, uh, which is the Western monarch thanks, Thanksgiving count, um, which, as I said, is done by citizen scientists every Thanksgiving, going to all the overwintering sites in this there's about 300 of them at least um, on the California coast, counting the butterflies and um, and getting this these estimates. It's still estimates because you, you, you can't count every single individual butterfly, even though the numbers sometimes suggest you can. But anyway, you can see here there was a big crash from '97 um, to a level. You know, we've had 25 years of less than 600,000 now, but it's been fairly stable uh, compared to the eastern population, which I haven't got a graph to show, where there's more of a, a decline. We had a sudden decline, and then we've just, you know, gone along at a similar level all the time. Ignore the line, that's just the number of uh, citizen scientists helping with the count every year, as you can see. Um, the enthusiasm has grown for, for counting. But you can see at the end there, 2020, where the, you can barely see the bar, and, and then 21, and I haven't got uh, 22 up there, but it's slightly bigger than the 21 bar. Um, so what's the prime suspect? So in my view, I think it's the rise of the neonicotinoid insecticides. And I've worked on neonics, as I've said at the bottom there, since 95. You know, this is where being an economic entomologist has actually been to my benefit, um, because I actually, you know, worked with neonicotinoids at that time, testing them um, for their impact on beneficial insects and mites. So I'm very well aware of what they can do. And but you know, and since that time, there's been a huge rise. And now they're the most widely insecticides used, most widely used insecticides in the world. Um, it's hard to find insecticides to use in your backyard, for example, that are not neonicotinoids. Um, and farmers have the same issue too. Most of them are neonicotinoids. So, um, and I'm, I can't go, I don't have time to go through it all, um, but you know, there's a lot of studies showing that there's a problem with neo neonicotinoids, particularly with bees, because that's where most of the research has been done, but also butterflies. There's some evidence that the declines are associated with the use of neonicotinoids. So these are correlative studies in the field, um, both in the UK and US, but there's also lab studies um, on butterflies, particularly on bees. And so with, you know, it's, every week or every month now there's, there's more studies being published and and they all say the same thing you know that these a lot of these insecticides these neonicotinoids are not necessarily directly toxic to beneficials like bees and butterflies they're not going to kill them immediately but they'll do things that that cause the butterfly to be less successful um, like in this instance you know this cabbage white butterfly larvae exposed to neonicotinoid called imidacloprid 
reduces pupil duration and size of adults, which obviously means that they're not as fecund, they won't lay as many eggs. So over generations, they will be less successful and populations will decline, like we're seeing with butterflies. I mean, there's other causes too for butterfly decline, but this, this I think, is one of them. Uh, one of the major reasons, um, the sublethal impacts of neonicotinoids in affecting um, the well-being of butterflies. I got into the act as well, looking at monarchs specifically in 2018, 2019, um, feeding monarch butterflies that I reared um, sugar solution with extremely low amounts, 23.5 parts per billion of um, a neonicotinoid. And this is a level that had, has been found in the field in wildflower nectar. And so it's a level that you know has been found. It does exist and it might be widespread um, or near to where neonicotinoids are applied. So uh, using that dose, I had 79% mortality after three weeks. Um, and so monarchs live for, for at least four to six weeks. And of course, the migratory generation needs to live for up to eight to nine months. So if this is not killing them immediately, but reducing their longevity, then this is a big problem um, because the butterflies need to live, you know, even the summer butterflies need to live their full life to, to lay the full complement of eggs to, to keep the generations um, going up. So you can see how these impacts on a butterfly or any species in the end can have a suppressive effect. Um, and of course, monarchs are not gonna be, you know, I'm concerned about the, the um, the nectar route in in uh, in poisoning butterflies and bees, but there are other routes too. You know, direct exposure of uh, residues on leaves or in the plants. You know, neonicotinoids are highly systemic; they're taken up by plants and uh, and they're long lived. And uh, and when insects feed on plants, they get you know a dose of the chemical. So monarchs can get exposure also as larvae too. And there's other lab results that are showing reduced larval survival when they have low quantities of um, the neonicotinoids. So there's definitely something happening. And but there's a lot of questions. It's like how how widespread is the contamination of um you know neonicotinoids? How you know you know how much plant nectar is involved and we do know that neonicotinoids are very water soluble and they do move um, in water and they're long lived too um, i know that from my agricultural work as well that if you apply them one year to the hop yard for example you don't need to spray the next year for aphid control because there's enough still there from the previous year so you know we don't know um, whether they're just confined to agricultural regions or urban areas or riparian zones. We don't know where they are on the landscape. And this is a big um, missing part of the jigsaw puzzle that I hope people are working on at the moment. Uh, there have been surveys of streams and, and they usually contain neonicotinoids at very low quantities again. And quantities that, you know, in the reports for these things, dismiss them because they're not quantities that we know are going to make us sick. Um, but who knows what tiny quantities might do to us over long periods of time. You know, it gets scary looking through this literature, as I did for the work that I did on the butterfly, um, then, you know, finding that some people are actually looking at impacts of neonics on people and showing some correlations between autism, for example, and other things I, I didn't pay too much attention to. But, you know, I, I got a feeling this is another DDT story. We may be hearing more about neonics, neonics in the future. Um, and the other thing I should mention too is that all these warning signs that I've been telling you about have been listened to by governments in, in Europe, the common, whatever they call it there now, not the common market, but the European community has banned the use of neonicotinoids in the wild, sorry, in the field. Um, you can use them in, in greenhouses, but not outdoors. Uh, so they've taken them off the shelf. Farmers cannot use them. They have to use alternatives. So there's no evidence that we are going to go that same route. Canada looked like they were going to at one point, but that doesn't look like it's happening now. So this is a concern. Um, another concern is that the amount of neonicotinoids, neonic, I should just say neonics, used is greater 
in home gardens and in crops and even greater in landscape trees and bushes as i said if you want to kill an insect in a tree or bush it's going to be a neonicotinoid that's recommended or what you can find and the amount you use is enough sometimes to kill the bees that are feeding on the flowers and that happened a few years ago in oregon so there's likely to be thinking about it landscape wise a lot more in an urban environment of these chemicals than in an agricultural environment nobody's done the study to prove that but that is my suspicion um so, so and this, this is just the tip of the iceberg in my view, because there's other pesticides too. We know, you know older pesticides like pyrethroids have impacts and, and there's new classes of insecticides coming along, hopefully to replace the neonicotinoids we have no information about. So long story short, in the West, the increased use of neonicotinoids, which happened about the time the decline of monarchs occurred, appears to have been the most likely cause for long time long-term decline uh, because it was so quick. Um, habitat loss and climate change um, are not as strongly tied, they're more gradual. They've, they've been happening for a long time, habitat loss and climate change. Um, so, it, it, But we can look at 97 as being the time, you know, around the turn of the century as when most farmers and most people that use chemicals were, were then using neonicotinoids. So that's why I think that neonicotinoids have got something to answer for in terms of the, uh, the long-term monarch decline from the historically high numbers in the past. But the bottom line was, is we need a lot more information on all this, you know, the impact of pesticides, the newer pesticides, and there is a lot of research going on, but you know it takes time, and, uh, and then it takes even longer time for governments to to um, act upon it, unfortunately. So moving on to this century and looking at this, you know, fairly stable population for you know sixteen years of between one hundred thousand and three hundred thousand butterflies overwintering every year on the California coast. That seemed to be the story um, and then 2018 and 2019 there was a huge drop um, from those, that sort of number from 300,000 down to 30,000 so at that time you know people that's when people started talking about extinction um, and that was only heightened of course uh, after the two years of 30,000 when it went down to 1899 um, and that's you know getting back to the beginning again is when I wrote the article about um, adaptation um, so what happened between 2017 and 2018 to cause the population to spiral down from 200 to, to 30,000, uh, 200,000 to 30,000? Well, what we can look at, what we can see is there were cat catastrophic storms um, in California during the winter in those years, just like we've had this year too. And so it'd be interesting to see if this year has a, a similar effect. Um, but because of that, that those storms and if you you, you know there's actually um, wikipedia pages on those storms so you can look back and see how bad they were and they were bad um, and so and we know we, we were monitoring the butterflies at the time um, and the, the populations were messed about a lot they were blown down uh, trees were, were knocked down uh, so the bottom line was that it was there was likely a low number of surviving females um, to, to start the new generation in the spring. And there's, because it happened in January and February, um, they were dispersed earlier than they normally would be. And therefore milkweed wasn't growing. And so, you know, there was a time where they couldn't find milkweed. So that would have lessened their prospects of, of, uh, of producing a, a good uh, generation in the spring. Um, and then about the same time, 2017, 2018, we had the first evidence from our tagging program that not all the butterflies that we tagged here in the Pacific Northwest ended up being in the overwintering colonies. Um, there was a, at least two instances where we had um, two monarchs, that, and this is a picture of one of them in someone's backyard actually laying eggs. So this was a big surprise at the time because they're supposed to be reproductively dormant they're in um, their migration mode they're heading towards the overwintering sites for overwintering as non-reproductive individuals uh, not to go to california to lay eggs on milkweed they find um, but this happened in two individuals and, and we can be sure that they were non-reproductive to begin with when they started their journey because they don't migrate unless they're non-reproductive um, 
reproductives do not migrate. So they did, re they were non-reproductive, and when they got to California, they changed to, to become reproductive. Uh, so they abandoned reproductive dormancy in favor of re reproduction. So I wrote a note at that time and wondered if it was a trend. I mean, if we found two in our tagging, I told you, you know, how rare it is to find a tagged individual, then it presumably represents a lot more uh, that we're doing this. And so it wasn't long after that, the fall 2020 happened um, when for the first time, none of our 1300 tagged butterflies in that year, not a very big number, but enough to get some data, um, none of them were found at the overwintering sites. And if you remember earlier, I showed you that the, the slide showing that they were all overwintering sites. It's where the majority of them were found. Um, but in this year, none of them were found at the overwintering sites. Instead, they were found in the Bay Area of San Francisco, usually in association with milkweed, um, like being reproductive. Um, and so we, we, so that year we we had a, the same number of tags as we would expect to find, but they were all apparently reproductive. So that was my first warning sign that something different was happening in 2020. So why was that happening? And this was you know lockdown time, so plenty of time to go to iNaturalist and look online and try and get information. And this, I got this data from iNaturalist with people looking at um, monarchs in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, in January, looking, you know, reporting sightings of caterpillars and pupae, chrysalises um, of monarchs in the Bay Area. So you can see 2015, you know, to, to 2020, the numbers were fairly low. They're, you know, less than 20 each year. Um, and then all of a sudden, in January 21, it shot up, you know, it's, uh, again, so that was further evidence that a lot more breeding was happening in the San Francisco Bay Area in that winter, uh, winter 2020-21, than had occurred in previous years, uh, just from this data uh, from iNaturalist. And so then I looked at, because I was thinking back to my previous studies on the monarch in Australia, and uh, I did a lot of work on the physiology of the, of the monarch butterfly, um, everything's determined by temperature. Um, and I was interest, interested to see what the temperature was in September 2020 or September, October 2020, which is when the monarchs were flying into the Bay Area from Pacific Northwest, um, migrating in, heading towards uh, coastal overwintering sites. And sure enough, the, the temperature during that time, the mean daily maximum was um, 75 degrees. And there were days when it was... Uh, you know, up to 100 degrees, um, and it was it, it was the record, um, you know, the the hottest September on record, um, and October was very high too. Um, so there are many days of temperatures above uh, 86 degrees Fahrenheit and reaching 100 degrees. So you can see from the graph there, um, the final dot at the end there, 2020. So the butterflies experience extremely hot conditions when they arrived in the San Francisco Bay Area. And going back to a paper I published a long time ago, um, we know that reproductive dormancy in Australian monarchs in, is easily broken. Um, it's not a diapause, which is a very fixed dormancy. It's very hard to break. The Australian monarchs had something called oligopause, where if they were exposed to warm conditions, they would rapidly become reproductive. And we don't know the physiology of Western monarchs, unfortunately. Nobody's actually looked at them here. We know the Eastern monarchs, and, and incomplete evidence suggests that they do have diapause, but there's some question marks over that too. Um, and it's probably a mixture. You know, there's there's probably individuals with both types of dormancy. But, you know, this... You know, so this just strengthened the, my hypothesis that um, the incoming monarchs actually became reproductive. So this record low official overwintering population that people were worried about, because this is the guide to the overwintering population, you know, less than 2,000. Um, and winter breeding at the same time, were these two things linked? And, uh, and so... I, this is another story, really, but again, involving citizen scientists, we we actually um, put together a small team to, to actually look at winter breeding in San Francisco during that winter. Um, 
and I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, we, we proved that breeding was going on. And actually you'll see Googleplex. And it's ironic that um, since I've done all the work online, the, the best site for the monarchs was at Googleplex, um, which is, uh, if you haven't been there, it's uh, Google's campus. And they're very uh, environmentally active and, uh, and establishing an environment for wildlife and the butterflies love it. Um, and so that was the best place. This is the number of adult monarchs there during that winter um, that we saw. So it's something like number per minute. So that's, you know, up to imagine walking along on a 30 minute walk and seeing the butterfly every minute. That's what we would see from through most of the winter. Um, so it's remarkable. And larvae too. They were breeding on the milkweed that Google had finally um, kindly supplied to them. Um, but there's, they supplied the wrong milkweed according to some people. So I'll get more into that later. But nevertheless, they were there feeding on tropical milkweed, um, supporting the population. And so, so although people were worrying about the decline in the population, I knew, and a lot of other people knew, that breeding was going on in the interior of San Francisco, you know, the Bay Area, and probably, you know, all the way down to LA. And we know they do this in LA more frequently anyway. So you couldn't say that the entire Western population was 2,000, as some people were saying because most of them were probably inland breeding and we can't count those. And, you know, I, I wouldn't hazard the guess as to how many, but way more than 2000 were breeding. There's probably, um, you know, 2000 in the vicinity of Googleplex. Um, so, so anyway, so the, moving on to the, the next season, um, which surprised everybody, because after that very low winter population, the, the overwintering sites, nobody was expecting to see any monarchs in Washington or Oregon uh, the following summer. But surprise, surprise, the populations were bigger than the previous year. I mean, it's still very small numbers. I can't remember what they were, but but they were bigger. They, they hadn't disappeared. You know, I, I wasn't expecting to see any, um, although I was really because of the breeding population um, that nobody was factoring in. So anyway, so that population that summer did pretty well. Um, and so moving on to the next autumn, which is autumn 2021. And again, I was keenly looking at the temperatures in the Bay Area during September, October to see if it was gonna be another very hot time and a distraction for the incoming migrants, but it wasn't. It was way below average. The line across is, is the long-term mean. So they didn't have a distraction this time. So this would prove, um, what was happening. Um, they, in theory, they should not uh, become reproductive. Most of them, they should go to the overwintering sites. And of course they did. <laughs> so, you know, my Pollyanna thing was vindicated. You know, I, I was predicting this all along and nobody, you know, I, I was predicting a much bigger population than 2000. Um, but even I was, I have to admit, shocked that it was, um, uh, 247,000, you know, to spring up from less than 2,000 to 247,000 in one year had all the monarch scientists scratching their head because um, it's not possible mathematically, uh, population development wise, for a population to develop over three generations to that size from if you say that the population is is only 1800 and only half of those are female and this was in thanksgiving so by the end of the season it was much less than that you know it was impossible so how did this happen where did they all come from so my main focus was the, the winter breeding and it, Arizona had a similar story too that they, they had a lot of much more winter breeding that year as well so it wasn't just the Bay Area there was a lot of winter breeding going on in California the butterflies had adapted changed their response um, because of the weather or the temperatures they encountered um, so that was my my preferred option but then uh, chip taylor's a foremost monarch specialist suggested there may have been unknown overwintering sites in california which is a possibility but unlikely i think because they attract attention and uh, so many naturalists around you'd think that somebody would have seen them but there could have been very low numbers and didn't attract attention so is it possible 
it, it is possible. Um, the other third possibility is Mexico. And I mentioned, you know, we, we think that there's movement to Mexico, or there definitely is from Arizona to Mexico. And there's likely a reverse movement back in the spring. And in some years, we think it's much bigger than others if the wind is in the right direction. And so we could have had um, a bit of a, a boost to our population in the West from Mexico in spring 2021 that helped our population build up. And in fact, Lincoln Brower, who, who's, uh, who's passed away now, but he was he was the, the king of monarchs, he, he suspected that it could be, that Mexican connection could be an integral part of our Western population, you know, keeping it going over the, you know, all the time, uh, because the Western environment is not the best for monarchs. It's too arid and dry. And our monarch is, uh, sorry, our milkweed is much patchier. Um, so it could be an important thing. So it could be one of those things. It could be all three of the things. Um, one of the things that people said, you know, were worried about when the population was, was so low, you know, 1800, and they saw the butterflies were breeding in California, they thought that maybe these butterflies were going to stay in California and, and not bother migrating anymore. And to me, as a monarch physiologist from way back, um, it just is absurd because monarch butterflies and insects generally respond to environmental cues. And uh, you know what they do is based on their physiology. Environmental cues like um, day length change, sun angle, solar noon, and temperature dictate the physiology of butterfly, um, determines whether they're gonna be reproductive or non-reproductive and migratory. So non-reproduction and migration go, in, go together. And, and they are determined by the environment. So if the monarch butterfly in Googleplex um, emerges in spring, it's a lovely day, but tomorrow is three minutes longer than yesterday and so on, it's going to respond to that. It doesn't matter that it's been at Googleplex and its parents and grandparents are there. It's not going to say, I want to live here forever. It's going to, it's going to respond to the cues, the environmental cues, and head off in the migration. So that's why I think, you know, what you know, the, the better than expected population in the summer of 21 was partly due to the breeding population in places like Googleplex, which did respond. In that paper I mentioned, we did try and do some work on that. And it did give not convincing evidence, but it gave some ev evidence that monarchs at the end of winter and beginning or mid spring were actually flying further north than they were earlier on, uh, which suggested they were moving north. So, but some monarch people, um, and this, this goes into my main focus really, this talk about the holistic view of monarchs and, and, and not focusing on any one thing. You know, so a lot of monarch scientists these days tend to be focusing on just one aspect of the butterfly um, and forgetting about the rest. So a lot of people are forgetting about physiology. Um, and so I did work looking at the induction of reproductive dormancy too. And, and uh, I, I'll pass on for that from that, I think. Um, so we, we know that decline in day length is extremely important in determining whether the monarch becomes reproductive and non-migratory or non-reproductive and migratory. Um, and uh, so there's no reason to think the California winter breeding population did not respond and, and help the population. Uh, I'm convinced that that happened. Can't prove it at the moment, but... I really think that was the major reason why the population rebounded. Um, um, but the possibility that there's some overwintering colonies that we didn't find does exist. Um, I'll go past that as well. Um, so it's possible, very possible, likely that the missing 28,000, you remember it went from 30,000 to 2,000, were actually inland reproducing and not on the coast, um, hanging out on the trees as per normal in that partic particular year. Um, and so moving on to next year, 2022, which is last year, um, and I monitor, I get sightings reported to me and I'm monitoring on iNaturalist and other sources too, uh, looking at the Pacific Northwest monarch populations, um, been doing it for a number of years, you can see. And last year, the numbers were really great. I mean, I think we even had monarchs in Wenatchee and, and this area, um, which we hadn't for a number of years. So 
it looked really good. Uh, nine times increase over 2021. And sure enough, we had um, the official total that came out just a few weeks ago. 335,479 monarchs were counted at the overwintering sites. So that's the best since 2000. So that, that's really, unless the neonicotinoids go away, it's probably the best we can hope for. Although we are doing a lot for monarchs, you know, improving habitat and creating habitat. So we, we could go higher. And I'm not going to say we're not, um, but, you know, that, but we've had the winter storms this year in California. So that may figure into it. But it's celebration for now. Um, so, so what, you know, summary, you know, the unsustainably low winter monarch population of 2000, about 2,300,000, 200,000, 300,000 uh, suffered serious consequences from severe winter storms, which you might say are caused by climate change, you know, the frequency of those storms and the severity of them. Um, so if that's true, then it's not sustainable. Um, well, you know, the butterfly can recover as we've seen, but it'd be good if we didn't have that population so low that they, they had to go through, um, you know, this dire straits. Um, so my, in the future, migrating monarchs experiencing wind, warmer autumns and winters um, will adapt by becoming re winter reproductive probably. So that might mean that um, overwintering populations will be vulnerable and need to adapt to severe winter storms and a warming climate. And overwintering in California may alternate, you know, as we saw between 2020 and, and 21, between breeding or non-breeding. So there might be years where the overwintering, the overwintering sites goes away, um, but they're mostly inland um, and vice versa. So the adaptability of monarchs or the ability of monarchs to adapt to changing conditions will be an in future, important driver of, of, of future population trends. So getting to the holistic view, and I've talked about pesticides and climate. So I've, I put these factors up in the size that I think represents their importance pesticides and climate are the most important factors right now in influence in the population, uh, followed by habitat, still very important. You know, we need more milkweed um, and improve habitat um, nectar sources as well. Um, roadway mortality, I think, is, is important in the spring when they're migrating. They're, they're very low to the ground crossing roads. Um, and I've seen in some areas quite a lot of dead individuals. And at that time of the year, you know, when they're they're recovering from overwintering populations at the lowest ebb. They're the most vulnerable at that time. Uh, there may be some mortality on the way there in the autumn as well. Natural enemies, we can't, you know, some people get very upset about natural enemies, but the key is the word, they're natural. You know, they've always been here and, uh, and always will be. And the monarchs are adapted to, to, to cope with them. Um, and then there's something called OE, um, which I'll talk more about in a minute, which is a protozoan disease, which a lot of people, a lot of monarch scientists will put it as big as the pesticides and climate. Um, but I think they're, they're, they're completely um, out of kilter in looking at things holistically, because again, OE is a natural infection. And lastly there, you can hardly read it, is human interference. And there's been a lot of talk about that lately, about us touching monarchs and, uh, and uh, you know, we shouldn't do it because it's gonna be a problem, but you know, it's right at the bottom in my opinion. And I'll elaborate on these things if I've got time. Have I got time? <laughs> okay. Um, so. Looking at habitat, they have different habitat needs depending on the season, of course. Um, so the summer habitat, this is Lower Crab Creek. Many of you probably know Lower Crab Creek. It's one of the best monarch uh, breeding habitats, or it used to be. Uh, have, monarchs have not been there for the last, even last year in the good year, I was surprised that there wasn't, I didn't see any there. I think somebody did see one or two there. But, you know, back to 2015, a population of two to 400, 500 butterflies will be in that one area, uh, just a couple of square miles. Um, you could go there in July, August and see dozens, if not hundreds of monarchs flying around. And mainly because of the milkweed it was all over the place. It, it's a, um, a great place for monarchs. And hopefully they, they find it again and recolonize it. Um, they, when the migrants come up in June, they would find 
Lower Crab Creek immediately in the first week of June. Um, and so I'll be checking again this year, hoping that they, they come up the river and find, find it again. And once they do, then the population just develops. And unlike Eastern populations, they don't move away um, because the monarch, because the milkweed's all in the one spot. And they, some obviously do leave and, and find um, new patches elsewhere, but most of them stay because they have the, all the resources they need. Um, so conservation, creation of monarch habitats uh, in the West is still important, and particularly in California, which is where all our monarchs come from. You know, without the breeding in California, we would not have them. So the ones that come up in June have bred in California. I mean, they, they were larvae in California. Uh, they were the children or the grandchildren of the overwintering butterflies. So without the spring milkweed habitats in California that we wouldn't get monarchs. So there's a lot of focus going on to uh, focusing on spring milkweed um, habitat restoration in California. And that's completely correct. That, that needs to be done. <clears throat> um, I'm an economic entomologist, so I advocate for milkweed uh, in low input agriculture. I work in viticulture and there's not many crops that are as low input as viticulture. And um, and uh, I have this program called Vineyard Beauty with Benefits, which means growing native plants. And, uh, and we have Ted Allway here who knows all about native plants. Um, I got <laughs> most of what I know is from Ted. Um, and if we grow native plants, certain types of native plants, we can improve biological control of pests for grape growers, but we also provide in um, a habitat for monarchs too. Uh, milkweed flowers and plants attract a, a wide variety of beneficial insects. There's a paper there um, that describes that. Um, and so two birds with one stone. And this is actually a vineyard in Oregon where they grow milkweed down the rows and along the side. And they see, they see monarchs every year and they have very few pests. So they're, um, they're a model for what I'm advocating. And that, that can be done in other agricultural crops too. And as native plant people, you're not gonna to like to hear this, but. Yeah. <clears throat> so non-native plants currently provide key resources for monarch survival in Washington and Idaho in the summer, unfortunately. So at Crab Creek is a good example of that. Without purple loosestrife, which doesn't occur in great numbers there, but the little patches that do occur there are frequented by monarchs. That's the only nectar, they, nectar source they have in August. There's nothing else growing. We could change that by putting in uh, native sunflowers um, because other habitats in Idaho and similar places in Washington have um, um, sunflowers. And I'm sure there's other flowering plants at that time too. But for the moment, they depend on purple loosestrife. And also Russian olive, you know, with the heat, Butterflies, and monarchs do need shelter and shade uh, when it goes above 9,500 degrees. And you'll see them sheltering in Russian olive. And at Lower Crab Creek, there is only Russian olive. And, and fire, recent fire has taken out the last remaining uh, willows or you know the other native trees that were there. Um, so there needs to be some habitat restoration for the monarch uh, places like um, Crab Creek. But moving on to autumn, we're very fortunate in having rabbit brush. I firmly believe that rabbit brush is, is the fuel for monarch migration, you know, because it's dependable on the landscape. I mean, obviously they go to gardens and ornamental areas, parks, and feed on whatever they can. You know, monarchs can feed on the nectar from anything just about, um, but this is the reliable nectar source for monarchs in August and September into October. Um, and so I think this is ex extremely important. Um, some recent research showed that overwintering monarchs, they, they build up their fat bodies, and most of the fat comes from feeding on flowers just before they get to the overwintering sites. And so this is important information because it, it proves that, you know, California gardens are very important in determining how fit monarchs are to survive the winter, how fat they can be. Um, winter habitat, we need to... You know, I mentioned there's 300 sites at least. Now, this is one of the famous ones at Pismo Beach. Um, we don't know that much about them, what constitutes their attractiveness to monarchs. Um, and so we need to learn a lot more about them and to manage them better. A lot of them are vulnerable to storms and a lot of them on private land so people can do what, what they want to do with them. Um, so we, 
you know, some of wooded hilltops um, like that one in the picture there, see that that's actually Albany in the uh, San Francisco Bay area, which is a monarch overwintering site in the top of that hill. Um, and a lot of them are wooded gullies like that one there, which is actually an overwintering site in Australia, but a lot of them along the coast here around Morrow Bay and Pismo are little gullies like that. Um, and in storms like we just had, they're not that good because they're like wind tunnels because they're so close to the coast. And the butterflies at those sites were all blown away in recent storms. But sites like Pismo Beach, uh, which is this one there, um, did much better because the trees are much uh, denser and, uh, and the butterflies survive better. Uh, the roadway problem I mentioned already. So natural enemies, I go through this very quick. But the survival, yeah, you can enjoy the pictures, well, or, or not enjoy the pictures. Uh, survival from egg to adult in the wild ranges from one to 10%. You know, most of the recent studies suggest between one to three. So they have a real challenge to survive um, development. Um, even when they're adults, uh, they, they're not immune to a praying mantid. So as a plethora of predators, I mean, every year we find a new predator attacking uh, monarch caterpillar or, or egg or whatever, but these are the, the common ones um, spiders, ants, earwigs, bugs. Um, European paper wasp is, is a particularly nasty one because um, it's exotic, introduced, so it tends to be overbearing because it doesn't have many natural enemies of its own. Uh, once it's been in a place for a while, its numbers will go down uh, because the natural enemies have found it and adapted to it. But for a while, they can wipe out all caterpillars in a town. I mean, I live in Yakima and I know, you know, five years ago, you couldn't have any caterpillars in the garden for in the summer for, for a day. They'd be gone in a day. Doesn't matter what caterpillars. They they feed on caterpillars generally. Um, but now it's not the same in Yakima. They've moved on. But in parts of the Bay Area, um, they're a big problem at the moment. Um, and they'll, they'll, they'll attack anything. This picture there is a, a monarch emerging from its chrysalis too late the, the wasp has got it it can't even get out the chrysalis shell and apparently they, they can actually take the chrysalis apart as well i learned recently and th at the top there's one attacking of the wings of a butterfly so they are particularly nasty but they're not everywhere fortunately um jumping spiders attack anything of course and, and stink bugs predatory stink bugs this was surprise a lacewing larva which you know they feed on aphids and you wouldn't think a lacewing larva would be feeding on a mature uh, monarch caterpillar but but this one was a picture sent to me by by someone um and then there's the parasitoids parasites um or parasitoids because they kill that's the difference between a parasitoid and a parasite Parasites don't kill, and I'll talk about a parasite in a minute. But these parasitoids, flies or wasps, um, again, they tend to be more common in urban areas, um, and they can be very damaging in small areas. But, you know, they're, they're not affecting the whole population. Um, so this is the parasite, the major parasite called OE, with the unpronounceable scientific name there. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Pathogens, um, they get sick just like... We do, um, bacterial and viral diseases are common. Um, and there's a lot of unknown diseases too. Uh, we don't know what they are. So OE, I'm going to talk a bit about this. Have any of you heard of OE? Yeah, some of you have heard of OE. So it's a natural parasite. It's a protozoan parasite that um, is co-evolved with the monarch over millennia. They only attack monarchs and a few related species. Um, and you know, if you know a bit about biology, biology, you'll know it's not in the interest of parasites to kill their host because they depend upon them for survival. Um, but you know, this this parasite can be very de detrimental to monarch health in unnatural conditions, like if you're mass rearing monarch butterflies. Um, for a number of generations, it won't be long before you have OE as a significant problem that causes the butterflies to emerge weak and their wings are crippled, you know, they can't fly. Um, but that's an unnatural situation. Otherwise, it's a fairly low to medium impact on natural populations. But we don't have that much good information, I have to admit, on the West, the Western population. There's most more information in the East. Um, <clears throat> 
So there's many shades of gray. It's not a black or white thing, again. Um, and the impact on Western populations is not well known. So, you know, it, it, it's a natural um, regulation thing. You know, you just, you've all seen this uh, curve with predator-prey relationship or pathogen uh, host relationship where, you know, the parasite increases and, and then the, the, the host increases. And so it's a natural cycling. Um, and we know this happens because there's certain places where monarchs occur year round and the pathogen occurs there. Um, and, you know, there's times when the monarch is extremely abundant and times when it's not so abundant. So it, it doesn't, you know, it's never going to eradicate them. Um, so I really feel the holistic perspective is needed on this uh, particular uh, pathogen. Um, and there's a lot of excellent research on the pathogen in the Eastern monarch population. Uh, and because there's a lot of it, people have assumed that it's of greater importance than what it actually is. Um, and unfortunately, we've had very little research done, uh, done on it in the West, where it's likely to be a bit different in its um, natural uh, population dynamics and, uh, and uh, dynamics of infection. Um, so some, you know, some time ago with the uh, tagging program, I had unfortunately in one year reared some monarchs that had OE, and a lot of times monarchs with OE will be fine. They'll look fine. Their wings are fine. Um, they're healthy. They can fly. They can feed. Um, and so I actually tag some of these. I didn't discard them. I mean, at the time, I, there was a lot of pressure from people saying, oh, you should just kill them um, because they got OE and they could infect other butterflies. But surreptitiously, I tagged them. And because I, I wanted to know if they could fly and migrate just like the uninfected individuals. Obviously, this wasn't a planned experiment. This was something that just happened. Um, and so the top level, um, the top um, numbers are the OE infected. I think there's six of them there, and there's two at the bottom which are none infected. And the data of the length of life and the migration distance between the two groups um, are the same. There's no big difference. You know, they, they all traveled about a thousand kilometers and, you know, length of life judged by recovery of tagged individuals at the overwintered sites. Uh, was about 115 days for both groups. So from this very small experiment, um, the OE infected individuals had no um, reduced viability compared to the uninfected individuals. So um, that's why I think we should, somebody needs to look at the impact of, on OE, of OE on Western monarchs in greater detail. Because um, I suspect they're not, you know, OE is probably less of a problem here than it is in the East. So we now move on to the non-native milkweed conundrum, which is very tightly linked to the OE problem, um, as you'll see. So these are the, the non-native milkweeds that are popular in California in particular. They're uh, available from commercial nurseries in most counties. They're actually banned in a couple of counties now. Um, but tropical milkweed, balloon milkweed, swan milkweed, the bottom two are African, and uh, the top one is Central American. So, it, you know, it's it's part of the American continent almost, um, and it's, uh, it, it's all, you know, it, there's some doubt whether it's totally foreign to the, the U.S., you know, the, the far southern U.S., it may actually be native but it's certainly not native to California um, or Pacific Northwest. So it is considered to exacerbate the OE problem simply because it doesn't die back um, in the winter as most um, native milkweed does um, in most parts of California. But far South California, it's not the same again, because native will hang on um, through most of the winter. Um, but in around the Bay Area, for example, the fact that uh, tropical milkweed can continue during the winter is considered by people that consider OE as a problem to be a problem because it means that the OE spores can continue from one season to the next. OE spores 
on native milkweed, the butterflies drop them off on the plant um, on native milkweed. You know, if they dropped them on showy milkweed last summer, then, you know, with the winter, new plant growth in the spring, there won't be any, any OE. So it all resets back to zero. So this is an effort to, to minimize that uh, infection going from one uh, season to the next. Um, so, so that's that's the rationale for for doing this, which is chopping back the milkweed. And you know, in most years, it probably didn't matter that much. But fall nineteen no twenty twenty, um, which I just talked about, when all the milkweed had monarch larvae on in in the San Francisco Bay area, um, it was a problem. And this is actually a, not a Googleplex, but another nearby site. This is a um, one of the gardens, the uh, ornamental, no, what are gardens called that where you grow vegetables and flowers and stuff, um, where milkweed was growing there and the, the people that were in charge um, responded to the call to chop milkweed down and ignored the fact that it had eggs and caterpillars all over it. So they were just left on the compost pile. Fortunately, people that, that I was working with went round and, and picked off all the larvae and, and, uh, and rescued them. But, you know, that shouldn't have to happen. Um, and so, but it's, it's a change in situation. You know, I have to admit, it, it, it's a different situation in 2020 than previous years. And maybe going forward, it, it's gonna continue like that. Um, and, and the other problem with chopping back milkweed is that, it, you know, it doesn't tell the monarch female that it's not milkweed anymore and, and it's not, it's not going to stop her laying eggs. So she'll lay eggs on the, the cut milkweed. And of course, the caterpillars hatch and there is no milkweed. It can't feed on the, on the stem that's, that's, um, that's all uh, gone woody. So, so that's a problem. Um, cutting them back doesn't stop the females from, from laying eggs on the stems. So the non-native milkweed supporting winter breeding may be responsible for the may be responsible for the recent increase in the monarch population. You know, people are celebrating the big increase, but, you know, if, if I'm correct that the winter breeding is part of that, then the winter breeding only was happened because of tropical milkweed being available for it. All the native milkweed in the San Francisco Bay Area died in 2020 by December, which was a much longer period than normal. Normally it dies in October. So there's... It's, that's changing too. That will, if it keeps getting warm, that will survive the whole winter as well. But you know, in 2020, they depended upon tropical milkweed. Um, and so what is worse, removing the host plants or allowing a natural parasite to coexist as it has for millennia? Um, that's the question I pose. And so I was a lone voice in this for a long time, but I can happily report now that some and I'm not sure if I left the slide in, but um, some other very respected biologists support me in this now. Um, because, you know, monarchs and OE and tropical milkweed have all co-evolved together in some of these subtropical areas. Um, and, it, you know, monarchs originated in Central America and they evolved to become migratory and to exploit the North American content continent but you know in their original form in central america guess what their post plant likely was tropical milkweed so you know they go back a long way <laughs> you know the monarch and the tropical milkweed and there's no doubting that monarchs love tropical milkweed probably more than than uh, the more than native milk you know so-called our native milkweeds so they certainly like it and so we probably should respect their choice in this matter um on, on the other thing that um, that came about because of um, a couple of papers that were not well done, should I say kindly, or they were flawed, um, which suggested the possibility that the presence of tropical milkweed might tell monarchs to not migrate and to reproduce instead, which is is not true because it's the physiology. Um, it's the, you know, Host plants can play a minor role in determining reproduction and and or migration, um, but not 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 the overriding role. The overriding role is climate, uh, sorry, uh, day length and temperature, and uh, and so 
you know, encounters with any kind of milk queen have the potential to 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 change their minds. As the ones that came into um, the Bay Area in 2020, September, um, you know, they found milkweed, but it was extremely warm. So the two things together made them um, reproduce. Um, you know, if there wasn't any milkweed, I guess, well, they, they would have still developed their ovaries. They would have still wanted milkweed. They would have searched for milkweed. And maybe that would have been a problem because they didn't, could, if they couldn't find any milkweed, that could have been a worse problem. So as I keep coming back to, Having tropical milkweed there probably was a, a godsend in retrospect um, for the population. Um, so, and, I, and another reason why, and going back to my past again, um, is the fact that the overwintering monarchs, and so that's the other thing, you know, with tropical milkweed, they don't want, you know, a lot of monarch scientists think that having milkweed close to overwintering sites could convince or to tell the overwintering monarchs to become reproductive and not, you know, remain in reproductive dormancy on the trees as they should. And yet in Australia, that happens. There are no overwintering sites without milkweed. And it doesn't determine, it doesn't make them break their dormancy and fly off and become reproductive. In fact, I, I don't think I've got the slide here, but I, I've got pictures of them actually overwintering um, clustering on milkweed, you know, and that and it didn't change their physiology by doing that. Um, and so that's another reason why I think it, it's not a problem. In fact, there's actually benefits, I think, to having milkweed closer to the overwintering sites, not at the overwintering sites. We, milkweed would not grow at the overwintering sites because all the overwintering sites are too close to the coast. But if we had milkweed a mile inland or less, then the females when they were leaving wouldn't have to go so far to find the first milkweed to lay their first eggs. And that could be a great help to the spring population. So finally, oops, I'm running over my time. Do you really want to hear the human interference bit? I could just, can I go on or what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, right, okay. All right. So I so there's there's been a lot of concern about rearing monarchs and uh and uh touching them. Did you know in California you cannot touch a monarch, you cannot rear monarchs, children at school cannot be shown monarchs to rear. Um like in my tagging program, I didn't talk about we had so many stories about people um children rearing monarchs and being such a an impact there's even books being produced on it the, the monarch that they reared has now been the focus of a book anyway it's just you know the benefits of rearing monarch and into conservation and producing future conservation this are just undoubted and so this is a real worry that we're, we're taking this away and it's something called the extinction of experience some of you may have heard of it was coined by bob Pyle friend of mine, a butterfly person who came up with this in 1975 and was worried about kids not getting the experience of natural history and, um, you know, the, the small things that run the world, caterpillars, tadpoles, you know, as you're growing up, as I did when I reared the butterflies in my bedroom. If you take that away, then you get a generation of people that don't care. And, and we're seeing the first signs of this in California with them stopping people from touching monarchs or, or rearing them. And so it's absurd. Um, and you've heard about the insect apocalypse. We need people now to care about insects more than we ever had before. And the monarch is the, the poster child, the, the gateway to insects for most people. So I'll leave you on that note because I think it's the most important note of the whole thing actually, because the children and the, you know, the people that are gonna, you know, dictate whether the monarch survives in the future and how how, man, how much problem it has in surviving. Um, and so we need them to be the caretakers. Thank you all for listening. All right. Not a lot of questions, but we have one or two questions. I think we might be able to do that. So if you have a question for Dr. James. Yeah. I would love if you could put that slide back up about home rearing and um, when it, when it's considered safe and maybe a little more safe to walk the rear. Yeah. 
Well, really, you know, if you do it in limited way, limited. You know, you use naturally occurring. You know, I have so many people rearing the monarch by because they found a caterpillar in their garden or two or five. Um, and so do it in that limited way. Whatever you find in the garden, you only do one generation. You strict cleanliness. You, you look online, you can find everything you ever you know, wanted to know about monarch cleanliness and hygiene to prevent OE. And you, but you won't get OE unless you rear more than one generation. But you just rear, if you're doing it just as a, a little hobby, hobby for the children or whatever, then you just do it once and it'll be fine. Give them exposure to natural day length so that they are not, um, you, know, you know, day length is important, as I've said. So natural day length. Um, and that's it really. So I encourage everybody to do that. And unfortunately, if you live in California, you can't. In Washington, you can't too. That, it's also a law here now um, from last year. Um, the monarch rearing program with the prisoners was not able to be done last year because Washington state copied California without, you know, they just piggy tailed whatever the word is, um, on from, from California. And unfortunately, even though the populations have gone right back up now, you know, common sense would dictate we should, you know, take that rule away. But governments, once they, you know, have a rule, tend to, to keep it because not knowing what happens in the future, perhaps. But, but yeah, um, at the moment, Oregon and Idaho, you can rear happily. Yeah, one more question. Yes. Quickly, you know, at Pismo Beach, uh, the eucalyptus trees, I think, that the butterflies are in, which are non native, what were they in California? What kind of trees would they have roosted in for the winter? Um, Monterey pines, um, other conifers that used to be on the coast. They're not fussy about what trees. They, they're not choosing eucalypts because they like them, just because they're there, <laughs> the, the dominant tree. But there are a number of sites where they're on Monterey pines and other pines, um, even deciduous trees in the in the autumn before they've lost their leaves, they'll cluster on those as well. So it's more to do with the site than the actual uh, tree makeup of the site. What's horrible tag on their wing made us totally connected? How does it how does it stick to the wing? Yeah. It's just a small sticky. It like, just stayed there for like a yeah. while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We spent the longest lived butterfly was ten and a half months, and the tag was still there. Um, and it, most of the wing had gone. It was just the, the tag bit of the wing, and yeah, it probably was actually a benefit to keep the wing intact. So yeah, they're durable. The low tech, but good. The year in, I think it was 2020, when all of the like giant lightning fires in California happened, like did that affect them at all? It could have done, I mean, that same study I mentioned with OE, looking at OE individuals, we also looked at individuals that had to fly through smoke. They were released in smoke. And they did just like the OE things did, the OE butterflies, they survived just as well, found their destination. So I can say that flying through smoke does not present a problem to them. Or maybe they went round the smoke, who knows? Until we get electronic tags and we know the actual route they take, we won't know. But obviously fire, if it's burning the landscape, is a, is a problem if the butterflies are there at the time. Um, but smoke itself doesn't seem to be an issue. I lived in Santa Cruz during that. It was really intense. Okay, so you know that that could affect them finding their overwintering sites when it's so close mm -hmm. on those hills, right near Santa Cruz. Yeah, yeah that, that 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 could be a problem. I don't know. I think they would probably avoid it. Go. We should probably why there's 300 sites in California. If they, you know, if they lose one site, they'll they'll go to another site. So that's that's good. Different from Mexico, where they just have. The one side. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. If you can help us by just making up a couple of chairs, start heavy, so just one at a time, work because it's not a lot of Thank you again for coming.